All right. Yeah, so I didn't know I would go first here. So let me join. Mm -hmm. So I think just a, a little context for this feature. We've been working on um, our electronic lab notebook, where the idea is that uh, anyone can essentially collaborate with their lab mates um, on a scientific document. And we're currently working on like the user experience to help people publish these directly to Research Hub. Kind of the long-term vision here is that you could have preprints shared uh, directly to Research Hub. And then um, we could have some kind of like tokenized peer review and version control happen on top of this. So like eventually you could share a preprint, have peer review, and then uh, actually have the whole life cycle of publication happening on Research Hub. Yeah, so this, this is gonna be a pretty short demo, um, but yeah, basically there's a button on the ELN page that you can click and it'll bring up this modal. Um, here, let me refresh the page here. The guideline should start out unchecked. So you'll basically select the authors, and these authors will come from your current organization. Uh, basically, we might also add a way to like um, search for authors across the whole site or something here. But basically, we'll choose an author. We'll choose some hubs to publish it to. And then we have to agree to some of the guidelines for posting. Uh, these are placeholder for now uh, there'll, there will be more information there eventually and if you just click publish and this will sort of replace our current uh, create post flow if you guys have used this before this and the create hypothesis are basically going to get merged together into um, this ELN publishing feature yeah and that's basically the demo does anyone have any questions? So what is the difference from the current post? Right now, uh, we don't we don't anticipate any difference uh, to begin with. Like, this is basically replacing the posts. Like, this is how we are going to be creating a, a post from from uh, from here on. It's like through the ELN editor where you can sort of like save drafts and work on something you know over a few days before publishing it hey thomas i think that's really cool i think i love the, like the rich feature set and like latex and all that stuff i have a question about like images and links can i put in images and links and then that raises potential like spam concerns but right yeah yep right now you can add images and links here you can also add like uh latex i think you have a demo here and we're also working on a feature to add, like, to embed sort of like Jupyter notebooks and code uh, that you can publish as well. Would it be possible to refer to like a specific figure from a, a paper for like, see this graph of blah, 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 see figure 1A or whatever? I think so, yeah. That should be doable. If anything, you can like extract the figure and then sort of like manually include it in the document. Any other questions? Yeah, what, one more thing is that um, uh, for those that don't, don't know, so basically like this uh, notebook feature is very similar to Notion and if you used it. So uh, the the feature set is, um, so we used uh, Notion to mirror a lot of the features we created here. And another thing that's important to note is that um, where Joyce is in uh, in the works of getting us um, the ability to assign a DOI for every publication. Um, <clears throat> so the idea is that you know if you publish a preprint through us, we would also assign you a DOI. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for this uh, question with. In terms of importing, can you import, or is it do you, do you actually have to physically copy and paste? Because oftentimes, you know, researchers wouldn't be working probably not like in this format. They'd be transferring it or so. Yeah, 
That's true. And uh, we did have, sort of have some designs, but that's not implemented right now. But yeah, we'll, it's definitely like we've been thinking about it and we might add it. It's a great point though, Joey. I actually saw um, some AI tool recently that allows researchers to just use their iPhone to take a picture of their like uh, physical, like uh, carbon copy lab notebook and have that be uploaded into like an electronic PDF format. So yeah, I think eventually if we could just let people take pictures of their notes and have it automatically be in RELN, I think that'd be pretty cool. Is there any downside to having in DOI? Like, is there a limit on the number of publications people can post or can people just post infinite number of papers and that's fine? It costs us 25 cents a pop. Mm -hmm. So in theory, like there could be like, if people were publishing like crazy, uh, like some kind of downside to that, we could always add something where it's like, like the user needs to like spend some RSC in order to cover that, to even like rate limit, um, some of the publications. But, uh, yeah, in theory, we can assign as many DOIs as we want at, uh, like 25 cents a pop. What if we have like a spammer attack? Would it be possible to reimburse them? Like if, if they create like a thousand, right? Can you get your 25 cents back if you, I don't know, revert it? I think we've had some rate limiting stuff in the past um, to prevent like people from spamming actions on Research Hub, but that's a, it's a good point. It's probably something that we should consider to like make sure people don't like uh, publish like a thousand posts in a row. Uh, I have a quick question. So, you, Thomas, you mentioned you're going to eventually merge it with the hypothesis. Can you describe this vision a little bit more? Yeah. So, if you've created like a hypothesis or a post before, you might notice that like the the page to create them both basically has all the same fields. Uh, it's like pretty pretty much identical. So, we thought we should just like basically combine it into the ELN. So, for the ELN, you'll basically write up kind of like the initial write up for the hypothesis within the L the ELN and then you'll publish it as a hypothesis sort of going through that same flow that I just showed but maybe with like a check that like you'll publish it as a hypothesis the UX is a bit of a work in progress but then you'll create a hypothesis page and then from there you can sort of add the sources and the papers like you you're used to that sounds good thanks Do you have any more questions about the the publishing feature before we move on to other topics? All right. Thanks, Thomas. It's a demo. Yeah. Right. Speaking of demos, uh, Patrick, you mentioned last time that you you can run us through the onboarding process. Is it okay now, or would you like to do it later? Um, maybe if we do it as the next topic, I'll have to like log out and create a new Google email. So yeah. I'll do that right now. Perfect. All right. So in the meantime, so let's discuss the paper removal notification and transparency. So for, for the context right now, I think the editors can freely, uh, edit and delete each other's submissions. If correct me if I'm wrong, right? So even outside of the hub that you are assigned to. Yeah, so that obviously creates some friction, right? So what if somebody, you know, accidentally or on purpose will like, you know, delete uh, other editors' posts? I think right now there is no notification about it. Like you can basically discover it by chance. And so obviously that's uh, not ideal, right? Because it might be the post that, you know, brings you to your weekly quota of posts or something like that. So I'm curious to hear what you all think would be the, you know, best workflow here around this issue. Have you ever found a need to edit or delete in other editors' posts? Let's start with this. In one case, um, I saw like a paper that had a, like a, basically like a chopped up um title so i wanted to modify it but i wasn't able to modify the original title only the editorial uh editorialized one so actually when the paper was showing up was showing up with the 
the broken title. So I wasn't able to to change that. So I don't know if that was you know fixed or changed, but that that is something that I've encountered. I actually did do one thing. There was one title. There was one paper where the editorialized title was like misrepresenting what the actual researcher was saying. So I just switched it back. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I, I had to take off my hub of one of the papers. I'm not sure it was there by mistake. It was just irrelevant paper to the hub. But can you can you explain further about people can uh, delete posts? Do you mean like any editor can delete any post from any hub? You should be able to do that, yes. Yeah, at the moment, we don't have a restriction uh, about that. Um, I think logically, and curious to hear everyone's thoughts, uh, like you should only be able to moderate your own hub stuff. Uh, I believe, yeah, I agree with that. I believe there are restrictions. So you have to be the hub editor of the specific given hub to be able to remove the papers that are under one hub. Mm. So you wouldn't be able to remove a paper if you are an editor of another hub. OK, can that's good. You know, maybe we need like, to verify that. Can we do something like Wikipedia does to edit when the information is not correct or like open? editing yeah i think uh so we we do want to get to a place where we have some content on the site that's wikipedia style while other may not be like uh for example with like an eln publication maybe it should only be the author uh but other stuff like uh a paper that's been uploaded and maybe it's misrepresented the community should be able to chime in and we should keep track of revisions where we can show that we don't do that at the moment, um, but that's the uh, the end goal. So maybe as a next step, I think we need to verify that uh, whether editors can do more than just uh, take actions in their own hub. Let's verify that. And also, as far as like deleting content, um, I'm curious, like how many people here have encountered the issue of deleting content being a problem is it just uh, jennifer or is it like a bunch of you nick um i had i had one issue where um if a paper is posted that is from behind a paywall but the person uploads the pdf for the paper i i had to delete that post because that violated the guidelines but then in resubmitting the paper it's being flagged as already being on Research Hub despite having been deleted. Um, so it was just one time that I encountered something with an issue with deleting a paper. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the problem is we don't know, right? So like if, if deletion, uh, is, there is no notification about the deletion, there might be people in this room right now who have their posts, you know, deleted by us as editors or something and you just don't know right what, what you posted it two weeks ago you don't exactly check on it every day <clears throat> yeah and i think there is a difference between deleting stuff from your hub and deleting stuff from the platform and there should be obviously it should be harder to do the second versus the first so there are there should should be some kind of you know issues preventing you from just deleting stuff from platform, even by mistake, because, you know, people misclick all the time. So you think other editors should be able to remove hubs, but not uh, remove the paper itself? Maybe it should be way harder to do. So you may just remove your hub from the paper with one click, but maybe you should like do something additional to delete the paper from the platform like maybe there is some kind of notification that goes to the original poster and like maybe other editors on the hub on the other hubs that are also in the paper and if they agree that this post or like majority or some kind of like critical majority agrees that post should be deleted post is deleted 
wouldn't uh wouldn't there the logic though be then because really like if uh, a post has multiple hubs attached to it um <clears throat> excuse me the editors on any of the hubs can technically delete it but if we did it so that the deletion would take off that tag and then if a post becomes untagged meaning that the hubs removed it all then it goes into some sort of basket where it gets reevaluated no yeah. i don't know how it works currently cool. yeah I think, uh, no, I think you guys definitely, you all make a very good point. Uh, we'll consider it. The, uh, we may not go with that route initially because only because not because it doesn't make sense, but because of, uh, you know, uh, technical investment, because, you know, sometimes it's much harder to get uh, this sort of thing done. Uh, but yeah, I agree that we need to do something about it. But like at the very least, I believe that we need to track who is deleting uh, what just for the sake of uh, transparency um, and then notify the person, um, the at least the editor of the hub that uh, some content was deleted and the person who like, you know, submitted the, the content, like a submitter should know about that as well. Right. And, and yeah. cu currently, papers that are deleted from the platform, they don't disappear completely, right? We have like ability to restore them. Can we also see who deleted them in the first place? No, you can't see. We don't track that at the moment, which is can, that's can, can, Yeah, can we do that? Oh, I see. So, uh, so we, we have an idea of like, is it misclicking or people just delete it because they consider it unfit? Mm -hmm for their hub and they also delete it from the platform entirely. Yeah, I think we can do something like that. I think also like, uh, as I'm thinking about it, I do think we need to come up with like, maybe um, just kind of like a checklist of like uh, a selection of why did you delete it? Kind of like when you flag content. So we mm -hmm. keep track yeah. and make metrics internally of like why things move around. Yeah, and maybe we can have like questions with asterisks. You like can delete it without answering the question. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. And we can, can also have like statistics out of it and see how much like actual garbage content we are deleting versus like we are oh. deleting content that are just doesn't fit for some other reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Makes total sense. That could be an upside, right? That's kind of like a rejection rate of the journals. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about, um, taking out the the tag of a specific hub. Like for example, uh, I don't want to delete a paper, but if I find that it's not, you know, belonging to my hub, I can just like take out the, the tag. Should the author get notified? Because at the moment is, you know, it doesn't happen. Yeah, I get uh, the the notification can be as granular as we would like. Um, yeah, uh, the author, should it be notified? Maybe, yeah, I think it could be that um, we introduce like another sort of like a uh, setting that you can subscribe to any update to a paper versus like comments. I think, uh, you know what I mean? Like you can have a, it configurable um, if you wanted to. So that's a good point. Yeah, just to basically, you know, avoid deleting papers. But if I find that they're not, you know, belonging mm -hmm. to my hub, I don't want them in my, you know, in my feed. So I, I, I do even like that the... I can't contact the author uh, directly. Uh, I would have either to comment on the paper, but that would just add a comment that it's not really relevant for the paper itself. It's just a comment like, hey, you should probably put it in this hub and not in this one. Yeah, I think the main uh, takeaway for me here is that we need to keep track of, um, why things get modified and also surface this information to the community. Um, I think, you know, transparency is good for the sake of like, maybe um, it is good to know like who did what action. And I think Stack Overflow does it. And that's one, one of the reasons they have such a great community and uh, really good content. Um, so I like that. Uh, so like if something gets moved around, like uh, something gets untagged, maybe we even like uh, keep track of that sort of thing and say like, oh, this um, paper was untagged from this hub. Uh, you know, we don't have to get that granular, but like I'm just thinking in the long run, we do probably want to get to that sort of place. 
Yeah, and it could be a good start for, you know, for if the publisher system kicks off, right, and there will be Wikipedia style crowdsource big articles, right, where multiple people contribute, it would be nice to, you know, have coherent notifications about, you know, working on the same stuff, who adds what, who removes what, this kind of stuff. Right. I was wondering, um, do you guys think that it would be important to maybe have like a checks and balances system where if there's say three editors in the hub and one person wants to delete um, a post, maybe it like will alert another editor in the hub to kind of cross reference it? Because I'm thinking like, I mean, if everyone acts in good faith, obviously everything is great, but maybe if there's um, an editor who's like in a particular field in science and like someone posts an article that's opposing maybe some of their literature that they've published on and you know they want to delete it and remove it from like research hub it kind of like uh be a conflict of interest there so that way you can have a second editor also cross-reference that ah the editor wars i think what colby suggested where you can tweak the amount of notifications would be nice right so and if editors could have an expanded notification settings where like they can opt in and to every single action that happens in their hub, including the removal of tags and stuff like that, on every paper or just removal of papers, can be up to them. I think uh, Reddit okay. has similar here too, where if like a post gets removed, it goes to like this like moderator kind of dashboard clubhouse type thing where all the moderators can see what's going on within their hub. So yeah, I think we should probably just copy whatever Reddit does when it comes to like the governance of the moderators. Yeah, can we also see if, uh, for example, some other hubs removed paper or removed their like hub from the paper, so other moderators can see that it might be garbage. We should take a look on it. That also makes sense, I feel like. Yeah, that's idea is if somebody notices um hey why is this one author's papers getting removed every single time you know it kind of looks a little bit suspicious so um i think if we have all eyes on it almost kind of like a, like a public ledger for uh, editors we'd be able to all see and be able to pick out if something like that's happening i think one other thing to keep in mind here uh like when we're prioritizing all the potential features that we can build is um do, do we think that uh like robust uh moderation tools are going to move the needle towards product market fit um it very well may be the case but um, my personal opinion is that some of these like more, more detailed um like moderation tools would be more apt once we're seeing organic growth in order to like sustain like a healthy community but I think we're still not quite there yet when you look at like our weekly active contributors. So maybe like um, some of these like uh, like really well done moderation features could be like three to six months down the road once we have a little bit more growth. Uh, sorry, uh, Kobe, on a side note, were you able to uh, implement the uh, like retroactive? I thought we, we, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, the retroactive tagging of papers that are already a research hub. Like for example, there's a paper, I want to put it in my hub. I don't want to create a new, uh, like a new item for that paper. I just want to add the tag, but it doesn't show up in my, in my hub. Like it, it, it adds on the, on the count of the papers on the, let's say the, like the board, but it doesn't show up in the list of papers. <clears throat> So you mean uh, when you when you let's say there was like a, a paper on one hub and you tag it so like to another hub you're saying Ricardo it, it doesn't show up in that newly tagged hub exactly like I want to bring it okay. to my hub like it adds to the count so the number of papers increases but you don't you don't see it in the list uh, okay yeah there, it should be it should show up there is a delay typically of like an hour but like if you're saying you you haven't seen it. Mm then that's no, a bug. Yeah. so okay yeah. let me add it to uh our bug list can i ask patrick how should the market the product market fit should be i mean yes, where's yes. the direction the idea is like organic growth in our north star metric which is weekly active contributors um week over week so in theory, like we should be growing at a sustainable pace, whether that's like 5%, 10% at like a, a week over week kind of consistent basis. I can um, jump into the metrics just really quick here, just to provide like a little bit more context. 
um, pulling it up right now. So one second, and then I'll share my screen. Um, but I think last week, like at the beginning of the editor program, we got up to 95 weekly active contributors. And then the following week, I think it was like 78. And last week, uh, it was 79. So, so here's our uh, North Star metric right here. Um, beginning of the editor program is like here-ish. And so 78, 73, 86, 95, 78, and then last week was 79. And this is only from one day so far. So yeah, I think it's too early to tell, but um, once we start seeing like 78 turning to like um, 83 and then to 90 and then to 96, um, we'll start to like be closer to the product market fit. But until we start to see that without any like outside advertising or sales or partnerships or anything like that, we still have to iterate on the future set or feature set to provide the value that people need in order to like basically refer their friends. Got it. Thank you. All right. Any more questions or suggestions on the topic before we move on? All right, cool. Patrick, are you ready for the demo of the onboarding? Yeah, I've got it all pulled up. Let me uh, share my screen again. Nice, thanks. Okay, cool. Yeah, so if you guys can see, this is uh, what happens when you log into Research Hub as a new user for the first time. Um, you're immediately taken here, which is kind of like a medium style, like, hey, what are you interested in? So for me personally, if I'm interested in neuroscience and psychiatry, and click those hubs and then continue and then i have like a um like profile kind of uh page here where i can fill out a little bit more about myself um adding schools all of this kind of thing um and then the next asks you to connect to orchid but I think that's pretty much it. So like very basic, uh, more or less just setting up like your my hubs and then your profile. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on that flow slash what we could improve in the future? Hey Patrick, I think it's really good. I would maybe after that have something explaining like the tokenomics, like some pop up, like, or like here's like five free research coins or like something like that to get them in sort of like the community mindset. And then one other question is, have we considered adding RSS, public RSS feeds to these hubs? I think that would be a good way to get like good juicy long tail backlinks. And also like syndicators will be like spreading our content and people will read that and come back to research them. It's a great idea. We actually have had that feedback before um, and we haven't built it out yet. So if, if we thought it was worthwhile from an engineering uh, perspective, I think it would make sense. Like a couple of people have said that. Yeah, it can be a okay, I could work on something like that too. I think like RSS is like I'm pretty familiar with that. Yeah, it can be like a good candidate for open source. Um yeah, sounds good. Cool. Uh Patrick, I, I think the like oh, I always try to think about this like on, on onboarding. I never like kind of know what to do. Like, you know, you sign up for an account like what you just did, get plopped onto the main page, and it's it's just kind of like, okay, like what do you do? Like, that's always a big question. I know it's a UX thing, and I, I forget if you guys have a UX person on your team, but uh, that's kind of where you get stuck in a way because, I know right now too, I know Nick's on the, the line, but we were kind of talking and like the, because like the, the upvote feature is kind of like messed up right now. Like, I really don't know where to go because like, it kind of like, yeah, there's just, there's just a lot on that one page and there's no real direction when you're onboarding. Yeah, it's a great point. We we thought a couple months back about doing kind of like a, a step by step um, like guidance of like, hey, here's how you use Research Hub. Like, like basically just walks you through um, with little animations on how you upvote, um, how you post papers, that kind of thing. It, in a perfect world, Joey, like when you uh, come out of that profile uh, like building page, what type of instruction would you like to see in order to like better understand how to use Research Hub? I think if it's like depends what you guys are going for, but like if it's if you want them to create a new post, uh, that your call to action would probably be more closer to the middle, so like they know like that's your first step, like uh, UX wise, or like if it's yeah, or if it's you know if you're trying to get people to click on things, maybe like 
the CDA would be like to highlight one of the, the most popular posts in a different color. Just so like people kind of know where to click next, I think, or just some suggestions. And you guys know how on <clears throat> on Coinbase when there's there's a different you can earn crypto by learning about a new one. Uh, maybe there could be could be something like that where there's it's kind of looping people into the reward system right from the get go and kind of educating them on um, how the site works. Yeah, that's a great point. So Nick, just to repeat that back. Um... It, it would be kind of like the Coinbase earn videos where like people would earn crypto for learning about Research Hub? Or are you saying like uh, we, we should do something similar for individual papers where people could like earn crypto for like answering questions about a paper? I was thinking kind of just the as far as that just first step when somebody joins the site, just a little tutorial on how to do this and that and maybe like a, you know, where there's you click the buttons, but they're, you're not actually making a post. It's just like a simulation of it. And then when they go through with that, then there's a little, little reward notification or something to just kind of get the ball rolling on. Um, here's here's the different ways you can use the site. Here's how you would do each um, to kind of ease that transition for people. Yeah, I think that's what Naomi, me and Naomi call user quests in the chat yeah people do that like especially if you subscribe to some kind of like productivity app like to do is or something like this they ask you to do something simple like create a task uh, put a deadline put a due date and they give you like some kind of bonus for that so maybe we can do that as well i think it's a great idea yeah, so I, I personally totally agree that I think a little bit of instruction would go a long way for Research Hub. One perspective here, which like uh, I didn't think about beforehand, but it's interesting, is that in theory, if we're searching for product market fit, um, one of the indications is like if you need to explain to people um, how to use your app, it's not intuitive enough. So like if, if Research Hub, you know, if people need an explainer video, then there's going to be a cap on like how well we can scale up our community. Um, and it might be more of an indication that the product is not like simple enough or the UX is not good enough. And we need to maybe like iterate on how that works instead. So that I'm not entirely sure because in my mind, like it, it makes more sense to explain to people how like the app works. But I've heard before that, like, uh, if you need to explain to people how your product works, like, there's no way it will work. So, so kind of like uh, something to balance there. What if you treat it not as an educational tool, but more of a just generic feels good moment, right? So it's a gamification kind of uh, stuff, and it you know it doesn't need to be there, but it feels good for no reason, right? Like, do you guys have like a, like a heat map, like Hotjar or something similar to that on the website? Like, how are people interacting with it? That'll probably help answer things too, right? Yeah, we have Hotjar. Uh, what we should do is like do a metrics call uh, one day and just take an hour and anybody wants to show up, like we can run through all the Hotjar, Google Analytics, uh, Amplitude, and just go through everything. But um, yeah, Joe, if you, if you want, I can, happy to jump on a call and run through like some of the like most representative videos with you. Sure, yeah, what, yeah. Um, I think like I think most people do like to just kind of mess around with stuff, and I'm not like feeling like you really need to an explainer. But the thing that I feel like is missing when I was on Research Hub for the first two weeks was um, not knowing exactly you know what the reward system is. You have to kind of dig through the web page to find what the reward system is. So just having like a notification that's kind of more immediate, because right now it seems like the RSC kind of like it goes up kind of a delay like after you post a paper it's not immediate and then it goes up like the next day and there's not a notification saying you got an RSC, rsc for uploading a paper it's just kind of changes and then i'm like oh i don't know exactly why that balance changed it just did and so just having that feedback for people kind of guides them in how they should be what and how they should act and um, that feedback is is kind of missing right now. But overall, I think people kind of can play around with it. It's not like hard to use. It's just that that part is missing, I think. 
Yeah, so I think that's like a super good point. And I, I think that could almost be like the onboarding that you can almost like, for lack of a better word, like train people what to do with like having like cool dopamine inducing like effects when they're earning RSC. Um, yeah, so I think we totally need to like do a little bit of a better job in explaining like how people are earning RSC. I know Anton was a big proponent of having like a dashboard on the homepage kind of in like the top left where it would be like very easily spelt out for people. Like, what do you need to do today in order to earn like how much RSC? So I also think that's a pretty good idea to just like, maybe not like, um, like walk people through how to use Research Hub, but give them like a set of instructions on what they need to do. Um, but yeah, I think getting the like rewards uh, like translated in real time where people can like, you know, maybe hear like a cha-ching and like see their like research coin balance go up as uh, they're upvoted is a great idea. I know Reddit does this too. Like if you like post something and get like five upvotes, they'll send you a notification that's like, oh, hey, people are talking about your post. Good job, awesome. So I think we could definitely do something like that. Yeah, visualizing the you know the source of your benefits is very powerful, right? So uh, similar to how people invest and they stare at their portfolio, like the visualization of, of the graphs, like what goes up, what brings me money. It would be nice to have something similar in Research Hub, right? Where you could literally stare at your submission history and see, oh, this is my top earner. Maybe I should do something more like this. Also, like now the uh, the reward scheme is kind of buried inside like a sub page, I think, uh, in one of the the top like uh, the top buttons. So have, having that maybe more like easily uh, displayed to people. Also, like are uh, are seeds um, like manually attributed to people? Because like could could it be possible that there's like there have been like errors in uh, like uh, awarding RCs? Like for example, I know how much like because I keep track of like my contributions, and sometimes they they don't really add up. So I was like kind of asking myself if that is like manually done or is like kind of automated. So there definitely could be errors if you are keeping track and you're seeing like uh, things that aren't like aligned properly. Definitely let us know, and we'll look into it because it's entirely possible that there are some bugs in how that's happening. So yeah. for sure, let us know. But yeah, we, uh, we don't manually, we don't manually give out RSC for stuff like that. Yeah, it's like... Um, it, sorry. sorry. I was just gonna say that it's kind of hard to tell um, what it should be um, because it just, it's not clear when it, whether it's an upvote or someone else responded to your comment. It's just not clear at all what's earning and so it's not even easy as a user to verify if the RSC balance is accurate. Yeah, it's, that... it's a great point. And like our uh, reward structure right now is like very much a V1. It's actually the first structure that we made like uh, over 20 months ago. So um, it's due for an update and we're planning to update it within the next like three weeks or so. We actually have a call um, scheduled on Wednesday at I'm on Eastern Time, uh, 1.30 p.m. where we're gonna chat with James and Connor, uh, the guys leading up the open source development about like a potentially improved uh, research coin reward structure. So if anybody has some thoughts and they'd wanna join that call, um, I can post in the community channel uh, just so everybody sees the timing and everything. But yeah, if you have thoughts, we'd love to hear them there. We're basically gonna like collect feedback and then add them to what we're thinking for the V2 of the reward structure. Maybe some can users have... can be incentivized to learn about certain topics. And I don't know, as someone said in a previous call that maybe some sponsors could be interested into learning about some subjects. So who knows? I, I mean, I really like the idea of having like a paper of the month or something in every hub where like maybe like editors collaborate to having like some kind of quiz or something where people actually read the paper um, and answer the questions right. Like they, you know, some kind of educational way to earn RSC. This, this would be pretty far off though. I think we'd need to get some AMAs going and like see some engagement there. Um, and then if we think it would work well to try and bring new people in, we could do some kind of like 
like uh, edutainment type of quiz or something at the end that people can earn tokens from. On the other note about onboarding, I think we talked last time about uh, like potential cloud, cloud of text instead of like manually choosing what are you interested in because if we just get a random person off the street they usually don't know what they're interested in mm. so kind of like typing things in especially to like find something very specific is i feel like is very not user friendly for like lay people Okay, so you're thinking like uh, revisit the initial page that you land on where there's sort of, it's sort of like the hubs page with some kind of improved uh, UX that helps to like show more of the hubs or where which hubs are currently seeing the most engagement. Yeah, maybe some kind of like entrance quiz where you asked what are you interested in like and it's it's not like in the terms of are you interested in astrophysics. It's like. Are you interested about people versus things versus space versus something else? So like very simple things, because if we want to attract lay people, they just don't think they are interested in astrophysics. They think they are interested in space, if it makes sense. Yeah, totally. It makes a lot of sense. There could be like a kind of bundle of hubs that are associated with space. I think that makes a ton of sense. I think this, Patrick, this goes back to the what we were talking about before on the hub structure. So right now the, the hubs, like the structure of the hubs is kind of like, uh, you know, could be probably structured better. So someone onboarding on the platform doesn't really know, like, because some hubs are really similar. Some are uh, very different. Some hubs are within a specific field. Others could be put into another one. So it's probably what uh, Olga says is like, it's difficult for a new user to identify specifically which kind of hub they would really like to, to be in. So uh, I think that could uh, make better just by thinking a little bit, uh, rethinking the structure of hubs or the discipline, let's, let's call it this way. Uh, so maybe that's something that we could uh, work on next week. I'm sorry, Ricardo. I, I uh, it was breaking up a little bit for me at the very end. Um, I, I got like the the current structure of the hubs is not ideal, but I missed like the suggestion on how to potentially improve it. Um, do you mind re-saying that again? Yeah, maybe trying to because uh, right now all the hubs are uh, kind of like put under specific disciplines or categories. But like for example, going through the hubs, I found some hubs that could be placed into other. Uh, discipline so they could be restructured in a different way so maybe getting suggestions from the editors that are you know we already have a lot of editors they could already uh, give some suggestions on how they would like to see their uh, discipline uh, structured and we could maybe restructure in a way that it's easier for new users to find macro areas and then maybe dig into more specific hubs within that within that area Okay, cool. Yeah, that sounds great to me. Um, if it can fit within like our uh, existing uh, tech to like yeah. make new hubs and stuff, then I think it's just a way of move, moving stuff, not really creating new new things. Maybe just renaming some hubs, um, aggregating some hubs. Uh, like if I have, if I can make an example, like in the math uh, math discipline, there's like seven hubs, but they're not really like a uh, populated a lot and there's uh, like only one editor. So like, for example, some of them can be clustered or in other uh, disciplines, some, are, some can be uh, grouped together. So something, something like this, that it's easier for a user that is not uh, quite acquainted with uh, Research Hub to you know, get a first impression, then you can navigate freely. Yeah, I think, I think it's a good idea. Um, I, I think it would be worthwhile to maybe Ricardo, if you feel like taking the lead on this to, to schedule a call where we can like solicit feedback from everyone and talk about it a little bit more. Because um, I, I actually kind of agree, like, I think it would be better to remove some of like the smaller hubs that have like one editor or no ed editors and like fold them into the higher level hubs. Um, just so that way when people go to those higher level hubs, they see more engagement and more comments. Um, but 
that's a hypothesis. I'm not sure if that would actually be the case. And it'd be interesting to hear what everybody else thought. Yeah, I think just gathering some ideas or thoughts from editors would be the starting point. I can do that. We can start from that and see what people think, other people think. Cool. Thomas, do you have any thoughts on the, the way the hubs are structured now? <clears throat> um, yeah, I definitely think that at, th at this point, we might want to add like a couple more like categories. That's sort of like the current way that we're grouping hubs together is by these large categories like biology, math, physics, but we could like make more like specific categories and kind of use that to, uh, yeah, like accomplish this nesting without like actually needing to code anything else. We just sort of create more categories and move the hubs around between the categories. Just to stay cognizant of the time, uh, we should probably move on. We, we can come back to the onboarding eventually, maybe during next call. But for now, we have a few items in the agenda. So if you don't mind, I'd like to proceed to the next one in the remaining time. So uh, a quick, quick discussion on the current state of the hypothesis feature. Has anyone, is anyone using it? What, what are your thoughts? Do you think uh, we should focus on bundling the articles that are already uploaded on Research Hub? Or do you think we should uh, um, introduce more articles when you create hypothesis? And when you do make hypothesis, do you try to come up with novel hypotheses that were not previously stated? Or you're tr kind of like trying to reiterate what is already established in the field of your expertise? I think it might make sense to kind of start with some existing hypotheses. And this also strikes me as a problem that like maybe something that we could be learning, like using through like looking at patterns in text, potentially learning some of these hypotheses. But Yeah, maybe we should also add some kind of like in the future, obviously, some kind of like description to what exactly we consider hypothesis, because there is hypothesis that is like conceptual hypothesis, right? Does world works this way? And there is like a personalization hypothesis, which is like, if I do X, does Y happen? Which is like very concrete hypothesis. So maybe we should, and academics speaks, speak about the second one, not the first one. And when we talk with, with lay people, they usually think about hypothesis as the first one. So maybe we should concretize what we, mean by hypothesis and maybe like we can show off some examples of how it may look like as well because hypothesis also might be kind of like a complicated loaded thing for lay people yeah so this is like a i think a pretty interesting distinction because the way we have the hypothesis feature set up now like it's uh it's pretty bare bones like you can you know structure it any way you want to um I know like in medicine, like when you'd like uh, search, you know, for specific things, they use like the PICO format, which is like population intervention comparison outcome, where I wouldn't just say um, do cigarettes or, or the hypothesis is not cigarettes cause cancer. It's uh, cigarettes in um, men over 65 who are veterans who have been like smoking for more than 20 years. Um, you know, cause more cancer than uh, like smoking like tea leaves or something. Um, so yeah, there's like a lot more detail to potential hypotheses typically than what I think would appeal to the like average person on Research Hub. So trying to like, um, yeah, like stick the landing of like the right level of detail that is included, I think is important. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what the best answer is. I think it's probably better to to be like more broad now and potentially zone into like, you know, more standard like uh, scientific hypotheses in the future. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of an idea. More thoughts on hypothesis? Also, maybe we can like have some, when you form a hypothesis and you try to find existing papers that are on the research hub, maybe we can somehow like filter them by the hub or something. Because 
like type in the name of the paper every time the one that you are trying to find is not the best approach i feel like because at least in my case i was kind of like trying to load papers first and then use them for hypothesis and then i had to like go and find each paper I loaded and put them in the hypothesis instead of like, let's say, just going to the hub and clicking and like selecting papers I want to add. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's like really hard to search just by uh, the paper's title. So we'll, we'll probably have to make that feature more robust in the future, like maybe have like a dedicated search page for it. but. Yeah, definitely. I've spent a lot of time trying to um, load up papers just from that search portal, and it's uh, very much a V1. All right, we have two more topics, just maybe quick updates. So what is the situation with the liquidity? Are there any updates and on, on the measures we are currently working on? And how could we increase RSC utility, both short term and long term? Uh, outside of currently used tipping functionality. Um, so what would you should we start with? Does anyone have thoughts on what do you think would be nice to use RSC for? The function that you would desire would be on Research Hub at the moment. I would like one is like a bounty for asking questions. Like I have like a very niche specific question that I want to know. I'll be like, I'll pay you X dollars if you give me like a really good answer. Connor, do you think you could like try and test that uh, manually now, like just through the post feature? Be like, hey, if you can answer this question like to my satisfaction, like I'll tip you with XRSC just, just to see like, uh, like this seems like something we could manually test to see if it would work before we build it. Yeah, I could like think of something. I was wondering for the bounty if like somebody posts, you know, puts in a lot of work and posts like a page worth of information for somebody, and maybe that person doesn't like deem it fit to like have answered their question. Like, is there any way to like hold them accountable for like paying some type of reward at least? Like to the person who wrote it, or is it like the person who wrote the response is just getting zero research point even though they tried? Yeah, so this is this is the challenge, I think, where it's gonna be difficult. Um, this could be something that like editors help with. I, I know like uh, open source development kind of works in similar ways with like uh, Gitcoin, where you can assign like a task to somebody who says that they can do it, and then they either do or don't. Or there can be like a competition among like a bunch of developers to build the feature, and whoever finishes it first, uh, like to the like requester's standards, receives the bounty. Um, the design space here is pretty big, and like I think it's going to be challenging to automate it in a way where like bounties always get paid out to people who like do the appropriate work. Yeah. The the end. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, the angle is something where, um, where ideally we would be like a, a bit of an escrow where like, uh, let's say you ask a question or something like that, we would hold uh, some of your RSC. And if someone answers your question, then great, we, uh, we pay that, we pay that person. And if not, we give it back to you. But there is like a bit of a middle there. Uh, and I'm not saying like it's something we're going to work on immediately, but it's something that uh, Stack Overflow does. And I believe Gitcoin also does that. I think I learned that the other day, James mentioned that um, you actually have to send the the reward ahead of time. But uh, yeah, it's definitely on our radar as something, you know, to think about. Um, I think like an idea that like me and Nick uh, riffed about one time um, was, and maybe I'm not sure if this is like something we can immediately implement or maybe it'd be something more down the road, but was something to the effect of like have hosting like a, like almost like a conference on Research Hub digitally. Um, and then each hub can have it like almost like, you know, if you go to like a music festival, there's like little stages you could go to and you can choose which stage has your favorite artist. 
so you could go to different like hubs and then we could have it where um like there's like some kind of like entry cost in the research coin um for that conference or if you want if you're a vendor and you want to have like your like product being advertised on like the advertising page of like the psychology hub for example you pay in research coin and you can have your banner up at the top or something like that Yeah, personally, I love this idea. <laughs> I think this would be ridiculously cool. Um, I think there's a lot of really interesting things we could do around events, like whether that's like even holding like an in-person conference um, for all the people who contribute to Research Hub or, or like something virtual. Um, yeah, I, I think that this is like a super compelling idea, probably won't manifest for like a year or two, but um, I, I think like a way to get started is uh, kind of just like hosting events on Research Hub now. Like I know Ricardo has been an advocate for um, doing AMAs and potentially like posting videos of like discussions around papers. And so I think like uh, we can stepwise get to the level of conferences just by like holding different like uh, events and stuff in a more bespoke fashion over the next like year or so. Patrick, is the tipping feature, because I know you said everything except the tipping feature, but the tipping feature, is that coming? Is that like pretty soon? Because I think like a lot of these ideas would help be validated by the tipping thing, because I think it's easy enough to make a comment or add an upvote, but like actually like giving the RSC is like a skin in the game thing. And you could test a lot of ideas through it, but I don't know what's the timeline on it. Yeah, so so it's on production now. So we can, we can play around with it. Um, it's called support. So um, I can share my screen here really quick. Actually, I got to log back into my real. Um, actually, I can do it here. Let me share my screen. So if you look at this paper, um, I would tip it here by clicking support paper. And then uh, if this wasn't uh, a test account, I would just like add in the number of RC and it would transfer to whoever submitted it. Uh, this also happens on comments so i could tip this specific comment so like in theory uh there could be a post that says hey uh whoever answers this question um i will personally tip with 200 rsc and then the first person to answer the question uh to the author's liking uh the author can just tip them uh via that button right there oh awesome i didn't even honestly didn't even realize it was uh it was there so maybe we need to do something around making it like stand out a little bit more. Because I, I think having uh, the tipping feature be like a more regularly used um, function would go a long way towards actually having like the economy portion of uh, research coin work. Yeah, like I, I just tipped somebody like one RSC and I, it's like, I don't know. Maybe it'll show, it'd be nice if it showed up somewhere very like prominent, or maybe beside the upboat something. Or it is. It does. But I guess it's not. Uh, maybe yellow or just a different color, so it stands out. Maybe some short, informative videos, like to notify the users, or stories like. I don't know. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so we're a little bit over right now, but one last question that I have for everybody is um, we had initially built in a business model to the tipping feature where um, like essentially a portion of all tips would go back to the DAO, a portion would go back to RH uh, Inc. But right now we've gotten rid of that. So do people here feel like it would be compelling if maybe like like 5% of like every tipped transaction on Research Hub went to the DAO? to then uh, be reallocated? I think that that that, yeah, I think that that's a good idea um, to like kind of get like a tre little treasury going for the DAO. Um, I think that there was um, like something uh, um, we discussed once before of like maybe having um, Somebody so the per first person to support a comment, um, say they support X amount, um, and then if it is like a very like promising comment, and other people start supporting it, um, maybe the first person that supported it 
also earns a little percentage of all the subsequent people that are supporting it. So like maybe a small percent will go to research, uh, the research hub DAO, but another small percent could go to that first person for like, kind of like initiating, like um, kind of the support for that, uh, incentivizes people to like really um, choose a like high quality post um, and, and be very selective with what they're supporting. Yeah, so personally, I love that idea. Um, Steemit, which is like this blockchain uh, Reddit style platform, which uh, did not live up to its potential in my mind. They had this concept of like uh, an opportunity cost to upvotes. So you only had like 10 upvotes per day or something. And um, if you upvoted new content, you would earn based on future upvotes on that. So in theory, you would better invest your 10 upvotes for the day, voting on new content that others then, like you thought, would uh, also uh, upvote it. I think this is a really cool mechanism that does a good job, like crypto economically, to cause people to engage. But I think there are potentially like uh, bad consequences of this. For instance, like I would start to upvote stuff that I know will be upvoted later, like Foz on uh, our science, for instance, like any paper that was about like ketamine or like llama antibodies, like I would, I would upvote those um, because I knew they'd get upvotes later and they're not necessarily like great science. So we'd have to think about the like game theory and then could even do it anyway and just see what happens and then take it away. Like if something like bad, you know, is going on, but um, yeah, I, I love that idea of like opportunity cost upvoting or supporting and then giving people like a reason, almost like investing or staking within a post or comment. All right, we're a little over time, so we, we can just push a few, few items that we have left to the next week. Uh, talk about next time. So the roadmap, for example, the liquidity will post updates in, in Slack. So it's, it can be dealt asynchronously. So stay posted for that. And yeah, let's conclude this meeting and have a good evening, everyone. And, and I guess one last thing, just uh, building off Jeffrey's last comment is, yeah, so Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, we'll be talking about like the V2 reward structure. So if anybody wants to join, feel free to stop by that and also post in the community channel. And we'll add it to the calendar. Cool. All right. Hey, thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.